As a former journalist, um, Monsieur Yves Dacor brings a unique lens to his work as the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, an organization he has served for nearly 25 years, if you can imagine. I was shocked when I saw that number. I've um, asked Monsieur Dacor to speak about how the media, what the media's role is in this era of crises. And because he has the unique capacity to be um, both frank, like most journalists, but also positive, unlike most journalists, um, I'm never quite sure what he's going to say. So I very much look forward to hearing from him. Monsieur Dacor, over to you. And I think he has chosen to use the more stable mic. I'm just checking the watch because I want to make sure that I will miss, not miss the eight o'clock deadline. Uh, stay, stay with me for a while. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, excellencies, ambassadors, colleagues, friends, I'm very pleased to, uh, to, be, uh, to be with you uh, tonight. I think, Eba, you mentioned the fact that Irin has spin off of the uh, United Nations, took the, the, the risk, it is a risk, to go on your own. Um, I would say, and you mentioned it's a bold move. It is a very bold move. It's a risky move. But I would say it's an extremely relevant move. And I really would like to spend a bit of time about why I do believe, we do believe it's relevant. I won't talk about the business side. You are much more aware how risky it is. But I just would like to talk about what do we see at the International Committee of the Red Cross in terms of trends and why we think it's so important. Uh, I think be, there is one thing we share with Irin is uh, several things, but let's say one thing is we share the the value and the importance of willing to be in very close proximity to people affected and to repeat this proximity, not just a one-off, to stay with the people, to try to understand what's happening. And I think the fact that you are willing to do that, that you are willing, in fact, to report from the crisis, and we saw your map before, and some of the story, that's a very clear call of something which is extremely important. So what, what will happen to us, you ask us? It's always difficult to predict, but I think I would like to say there is at least, th there will be 10, but let's say three trends which will inform, which are in informing already our environment and which continue to inform our environment. The first one, I think when you look at humanitarian crisis, and sometimes you can say political crisis, I think we all know them, but they are there to last. And it's sad to say that. We are more and more aware because we could talk now about protracted cri crisis, protracted conflict. But if you just look two minutes about migration, for example, that, this, that Europe has now discovered as a crisis, right? We all know that migration will remain a huge crisis over the next coming years. We know it will continue to shape our political agenda. It is already the case. I would argue next year we will see how much migration will definitely be a, a game changer when it comes to political agenda. It will continue to affect our policies, our practice. And if I just give you two examples why it will last, take Syria. In Syria, we all know that there is at least 7 million internally displaced people which are still within Syria, trying in fact to find their way there, trying as much as they can to stay in Syria as close as possible to the belonging to their people. We know that if there is no options, if the fighting continue with the level of violence we seek, they will have to leave. And they don't want to leave, but no other options. Seven million, this is just Syria. We know it. We can just zoom in Lake Chad, northeast Nigeria. Look what is happening there. Heavy fighting, very complicated. People have to move from northeast Nigeria to Niger. Right? And we imagine what it means for the people. We need also the level of risk they are taking, and we know very well what will happen. They will have to move. They will have to continue to move. So they will be with us soon. We know, check, zoom in in Libya. We know exactly what's happening in Libya, and we know also the crisis there. We can talk about Iraq, what will happen in Mosul, and not only Mosul, and the tensions again in the region. We can talk about Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, <coughs> Afghanistan. Let's talk about Afghanistan for a minute. We know the situation in Afghanistan, despite of the conference in Brussels, will continue to be difficult. There's a lack of investment in terms of structure, system. We know the fighting are high. Access to, to health is very difficult. So people will have no other choices than to leave. 
They will be with us, we know it, not just in Europe. So crisis will last, and they will be with us, which is maybe new, is they are shaping our agenda here. That was maybe not the case before. Our local agenda is shaped today by the Syrian crisis, right? And it will continue to be so, and not just by the Syrian crisis. That's the first element. The second one, and here I'm not sure I'm right, so let me try. What I see, what we see is containment strategy. The ambition to contain the problem far from home, somewhere, right? And hoping it will stay there. If there is one thing we have to learn about what happens the last 18 months is this containment strategy do not work. Or let's say, let's be nice, work short term. So we can build wall. We can hope and pray that people will stay there, but we all know they will come, right? In Europe, but also around the world. Same, by the way, for infectious epidemic. Look at Ebola, right? You can hope that somewhat we contain the crisis far away and that health system, or we hope, will be able to deal with the shock. We all know that in most of the country where we're working, in fact, health system are not anymore in a position to absorb shock. We all know that there's a lack of investment to be able to do so. So the idea that we can contain crisis is an idea which I would say makes maybe some tractions politically in the media, but we know here in this room that can't be the only solution. So we need to understand what's happening in order to be, to be able to inform citizens, including here, in this country, in Europe, and in all our capitals. So containment will be discussed again and again. There will be a lot of promise about containment, I can tell you none of this promise will be in fact reached because it won't be possible. The third trend, and it's a difficult one to capture, but it's something we perceive very strongly both at our level, humanitarian, and specifically when you are the Red Cross like us, but also I would say in media, is that trust, trust is become a rarer commodities around the world. That's very clear. We see that everywhere, both we see in our society that people don't trust anymore, or maybe less, their institution, their media, by the way. We see that, that's very clear, the trend is heavy. But we see also that in society in crisis, people would have a tendency, as a default mode, not trust the other. And there is a lot of explanation about the world in which we operate, about the connectivity, about some of the issues related to the economic crisis, which, ev which is everywhere. But the reality is, Default mode is a mode of prove it. You are the Red Cross, you are humanitarian, you are the media, you do a good job, show me, prove it. I will not trust you just because you tell me you're doing well. So if I look at these three trends, and just these three, we can go on on several, but let's say on the, on the three one, we all know it will continue to shape clearly our agenda, our practice, our policies. So what does that mean? And here, I have three asks for you. No free lunch, no free dinner, no free speech, right? <laughs> so, the, the first one, and I think it's a big challenge, we really, I would like you to help us to embrace complexity. We are living in a very complex world, and we are aware of that. And what worries me, in our sector, humanitarian development, is the deconnections, not so much between Geneva and the field, that's fine. But what I find more worrying is the deconnection between policies and the realities. I see a lot of policies when it comes to health, when it comes to humanitarian in general, development, which makes a lot of sense. I do understand because they are systemic. But when you see the reality on the ground, they're so far from what we should do, what should happen to the people. And it's a complex environment, I know. I know we are all would like to have a black and white, a good and bad, but it doesn't happen. So we need you to be able to help us to communicate, to report about complexity. And I know it's difficult. I'm dramatically lacking that in the media. I love the social media, as everybody, but it doesn't help us to understand complexity, right? Really. So there is something about complexity which is a huge challenge. I don't have time neither to read all what you produce, so there is an issue about that too. But there is something about being able to express complexity and help us to embrace complexity, especially at policy level, at strategic level. So that's my first ask. Make us more intelligent, that's what my message. The second one, it's a very complicated one too, is 
it's time for us, and again here, really the people in the room, journalists, media, Iran of course, but also ambassadors, diplomats, humanitarian development, policy, government official. It's a time where we have at the same time to understand that numbers are important. So of course, when you talk about migration again, or humanitarian crisis, what qualify humanitarian crisis is number. How many billions we're talking? I was interested that the three of you almost talk about 20 billions about humanitarian crisis. I would be interested to know exactly why do you talk about 20 billion? What does that mean? Do you have a reflections about what this means, 20 billions? Why do you use these figures? Right? And are you sure it's the right one? And I would argue this is the wrong one. And I can talk about that for a minute. But we're also talking about 42 million IDPs. 65 million forced displacement. And then you go in a country, I was in Germany yesterday, and what do you talk? And rightly so, 60,000 unaccompanied children. So I think it gives a magnitude of the problem, and that's very useful. But it doesn't tell us anything about the reality of the people. So it's useful to have it, but what I would like to ask you is please help us to see the people beyond the number. Critical numbers are useful, but beyond the numbers, please help us to see the people. See the people, why? Because we need to understand what's happening. And here, again, my concern, when I look at the media, when I look at us, we still have the way we report, the way we communicate, by the way, humanitarian, we still communicate the same way about the people we helped that 20 years ago. I'm happy that Irene has changed, and you dramatically have changed the way you are communicating, but if I look at humanitarian, the impression is still that we are here raising funds and then doing and operating and we will then help the poor people there. I mean, this time is over. This time is over and the revolution happening is the identity of the people is changing. They have multiple identities. They are victims, but they have opinion more and more. They are challenging. They constantly challenge us. I'm not talking about warrior. I'm talking people. You know, in Somalia, people are comparing what we offer. They look at us, the International Committee of the Red Cross, 35 years of presence. They look at us as service provider. If we don't provide the right service, wow, tough these days. It's amazing. People are connected. They change the way they're looking at us. So very critical that we are able to understand what's happening. Things are changing. So if we are able to see the people, see their needs, see their coping mechanism, it will help us also to understand what it means in terms of policies. So please help us beyond the numbers. The numbers are important to see the people. My, I had a long list of asks, but I stop at three, right? Uh, my, my third and last ask to you is please accompany us. And somewhat, how can I say that? Frame, be a place where the humanitarian and development landscape and the changing landscape is commented, discussed, challenged. Please also be aware about on the vocabulary you use. You still use sometimes humanitarian system. Rarely, by the way, rarely. We still use humanitarian system. This is a concept which do not describe anything which is close to reality. System gives me the impression this is something which is, you know, solid, have a central command, you know, specific rule, we all work the same. Wow. Let's wake up. We're talking about the landscape. And why I'm saying a landscape? Because we have to capture the fact that we are diverse actors, diverse humanitarian actors, different perspective. And what I found the most interesting right now, it's not us, the formal actor, is the fact that informal actors are playing a bigger role more and more. We need to capture that. In Syria, and I'm sorry to say that, including for my own organization, we are pushing every day the limit of the possible. What we might represent maybe 20, 25% of the aid arrive to people. I don't know about the figures. I'm trying to say that, right? What I'm saying, there is other way. And they're not perfect. They may be not impartial. They're not neutral. But there is through business, through people, through the community, through the diaspora. We need to capture that. We need to understand that. So when you say 20 billion, this is just a formal system. It says nothing about the reality of the aid, the money how people are surviving in Syria, in Somalia, in Afghanistan. So please capture that, help us to understand that, because what will happen, and this is why it's so interesting to have you making this move right now, our sectors, 
the development of methane sectors will go through a major change in the next, next five years. And I think we have just started to understand that, but the change will be just impressive. And it would not just be the m uh, issue of money or resources, it would mainly be, in fact, I would say, informed by two factors. One, by, as I mentioned, the revolution and maybe the power shift between us and the people we try to serve and help. People are moving, they're fast, they're tough, they know how it works. So I think they will more and more look directly at where they can find money, how they can maybe reach out to you, and they might not want us always as intermediary. I think it's happening soon. The other big elements and the big questions will be who is really able, seriously, to get access within the crisis. What strikes me over the last few years is how much we have developed very complex coordination mechanisms, complex response around the crisis. Who is in Yemen right now? Seriously, being able to work, not just have outsource risk to its local partner. Really, being there, taking the risk, international and national staff. And I'm not saying that just as a message like that, I'm convinced that we need to have a proximity. We need to be there. Why? Because this is the only way to understand the needs, but also to engage governments, non state arm group. We need to be able to engage them. And it can't just be the ICSC. It's not enough. And even, even us, we are very limited if I look at the needs. If I look at Libya right now, if I look at Syria, beyond Aleppo, we talk about Aleppo, rightly so, but if I look at what's happening in the country today, if I look at what's happening inside the prison in the region, I mean, we have to be able to do more. We have to be able, and the question of access, so please hear in, your indicators is also who has access, where, and please tell us through partner or directly. It will help us in the discussion. It will challenge us maybe to push us a little bit further or where we need to do that. If we don't do that, I'm afraid, I'm afraid over the next five years, you won't only, you have problems, but we will have also serious problems as humanitarian and development. So bold move, Eba, but so useful, so timely. So I wish you all the best. Thank you, and to us all. So thank you for not running till eight o'clock. Um, we will have a panel after all. When you talked about um, the role of journalists in providing, making sense of complexity, and yet not having time to read it and wanting it in short chunks, it reminded me a little bit of when donors said they wanted a WHS monitoring system that was robust and yet light. So um, we will do our best to strike that balance. Um, but I thank you for that feedback. In fact, we invited all of you here uh, because you are our users and we want feedback from you on what we should be covering, on what are the issues that matter, on how we can be useful to you. And so this isn't only um, a promotional event, it's really to start building that relationship and to be able to, I hope in the panel as well, um, hear from you in terms of, of where Erin should be concentrating. To your points on um, you know, human stories, complexity, making sense of complexity, being close to the action, that's the role of journalism, any kind of journalism, right? And we see specialized media in the financial sector, in the political sector, in the sports sector even, doing exactly that. And yet in a sector that deals with life and death, there are very few specialized media to provide those kinds of qualities. And so it's, it's shocking to us how little, how few actors there are in this space, and, and that's one of the gaps that we hope to fill. <laughs>